Yes, some of them do believe in a cyclical universe, and the Big Bang is an event that occurred approximately 60 years ago when space became extremely hot, dense, and packed with particles. The Big Bang theory has remained the most successful explanation for our cosmic origins, explaining how the universe began as hot, dense, and radiation-rich matter that expanded, cooled, and gravitated ever since. This process created protons and neutrons, the first light elements, stable atoms, stars, galaxies, planets, and intricate chemistry that, some 13.8 billion years later, could give rise to life. The universe is still expanding and we are trying to figure out exactly where it came from and how it came to be the way it is today. However, the more we investigate, the more the Big Bang Theory fractures the idea that the universe emerged out of nothing, which is why many scientists, including renowned physicist Brian Cox, vehemently reject it. The Big Bang Theory faces growing challenges as the James Webb Space Telescope, the most potent space telescope ever, gathers very compelling evidence that suggests the Big Bang wasn't actually the beginning of everything. This begs the questions of what existed before the Big Bang, and if it wasn't the beginning, then what was? Stay tuned today as we shed some new light on the origin of the universe in today's episode of I-200M. The first time the phrase, the Big Bang, was uttered was over 20 years after the idea was first described. Ironically, the term itself comes from one of the theory's greatest detractors, Fred Hoyle, who was a staunch advocate of the rival idea of a steady-state cosmology. In 1949, he appeared on BBC Radio and advocated for what he called the perfect cosmological principle, the notion that the universe was homogeneous in both space and time, meaning that any observer, not only anywhere but any time, would perceive the universe to be in the same cosmic state. He went on to deride the opposing notion as a hypothesis that all matter of the universe was created in one Big Bang at a particular time in the remote past, which he then called irrational and claimed to be outside science. But I'm afraid I don't really believe in the Big Bang. However, the idea in its original form wasn't simply that all the universe's matter was created in one moment. The idea that the universe, not just the matter contained within it, had emerged from a state of non-being in the finite past was initially mocked by Hoyle, but it had already changed from its original meaning. As absurd as it may sound, this idea was an inevitable but difficult to accept byproduct of Einstein's new theory of gravity, general relativity, which he proposed back in 1915. When Einstein first cooked up the general theory of relativity, our concept of gravity forever shifted from the prevailing notion of Newtonian gravity. Under Newton's laws, the way gravitation worked was that any and all masses in the universe exerted a force on one another instantaneously across space in direct proportion to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. But in the aftermath of his discovery of special relativity, Einstein and many others quickly recognized that there was no such thing as a universally applicable definition of what distance was or even what instantaneously meant with respect to two different locations. With the introduction of Einstein's relativity, the notion that observers in different frames of reference would all have their own unique, equally valid perspectives on what distances between objects were and how the passage of time worked, it was almost immediate that the previous absolute concepts of space and time were woven together into a single fabric, space-time. All objects in the universe move through this fabric and the task for a novel theory of gravity would be to explain how not just masses but all forms of energy shape this fabric that underpins the universe itself. Although the laws that governed how gravitation worked in our universe were put forth in 1915, the critical information about how our universe was structured had not yet come in. While some astronomers favored the notion that many objects in the sky were actually island universes located well outside the Milky Way galaxy, most astronomers at the time thought that the Milky Way galaxy represented the full extent of the universe. The reason Einstein added a cosmological constant, a special kind of fudge factor to his equations, even though it was mathematically permissible, was because in the absence of one, the laws of general relativity would guarantee that a universe with uniformly distributed matter, as ours appeared to be, would be unstable against gravitational collapse. Einstein sided with this latter viewpoint, and believed the universe was static and eternal. This early story that Einstein and others told themselves in 1922 would quickly change thanks to two developments, one theoretical and the other observational. In reality, 
It was very simple to demonstrate that any initially uniform distribution of motionless matter, regardless of shape or size, would inevitably collapse into a singular state under its own gravitational pull. By adding this extra term of cosmological constant, Einstein could tune it so that it would balance out the inward pull of gravity by figuratively pushing the universe out with an equal and opposing action. After completely figuring out the equations governing an isotropically and homogeneously identical universe filled with all kinds of matter, radiation, and other forms of energy, Alexander Friedman discovered that such a universe could never remain static, not even in the presence of a cosmological constant, and that it would always expand or contract based on the details of its initial conditions. Edwin Hubble was the first to discover in 1923 that the spiral nebulae in our heavens were located far beyond the Milky Way galaxy, which contained no items that might have jeopardized our home galaxy. As Vesto Slipher had previously noted, the spirals and ellipticals discovered across the cosmos were actually their own island universes that are now known as galaxies. Furthermore, the vast majority of them appear to be traveling away from us at amazing rates. In 1927, the universe must have expanded to its current state from a single point of origin, which he called either the cosmic egg or the primeval atom. This was the original idea behind what would eventually become the modern theory of the Big Bang. George Lemaitre was the first to put these pieces of information together, realizing that the universe is expanding today, and that if things are getting farther apart and less dense today, then they must have been closer together and denser in the past. The idea that the universe had a beginning, or a day without yesterday, was not generally accepted for some time. Lemaitre originally sent his ideas to Einstein, who initially dismissed Lemaitre's work by responding, Your calculations are correct, but your physics is abominable. Despite the resistance to his ideas, however, Lemaitre would be vindicated by further observations of the universe. Many more galaxies had their distances and redshifts measured leading to the overwhelming conclusion that the universe was and still is expanding equally and uniformly in all directions on large cosmic scales. In the 1930s, Einstein conceded, referring to his introduction of the cosmological constant in an attempt to keep the universe static as his greatest blunder. However, the next great development in the formulation of what we know as the Big Bang wouldn't come until the 1940s when George Gamow, perhaps not so coincidentally an advisee of Alexander Friedman, came along. In a remarkable leap forward, he recognized that the universe was not only full of matter but also radiation, and that radiation evolved somewhat differently from matter in an expanding universe. Gamov used this information to make three excellent general predictions about the early universe. Universe 1. At some point, the radiation from a universe was hot enough for a quantum of radiation to have ionized every neutral atom and this residual radiation bath should continue to exist today at a temperature only slightly above absolute zero. 2. At some even earlier point, the radiation would have been too hot to even form stable atomic nuclei, so an earlier stage of nuclear fusion should have occurred where an initial mix of protons and neutrons should have fused together to create an initial set of atomic nuclei, an abundance of elements that predates the formation of atoms. 3. Finally, this means that there would be some point in the universe's history after atoms had formed where gravitation pulled this matter together into clumps, leading to the formation of stars and galaxies. These three major points, along with the already observed expansion of the universe, form what we know today as the four cornerstones of the Big Bang. Although one was still free to extrapolate the universe back to an arbitrarily small, dense state, even to a singularity if you're daring enough to do so, that was no longer part of the Big Bang theory that had any predictive power. Instead, it was the emergence of the universe from a hot, dense state that led to our concrete predictions about the universe. Over the 1960s and 1970s, as well as ever since, a combination of observational and theoretical advances unequivocally demonstrated the success of the Big Bang in describing our universe and predicting its properties. 1. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background and the subsequent measurement of its temperature and the black body nature of its spectrum eliminated alternate theories such as the steady state model. 2. The measured abundances of the light elements throughout the universe verified the predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis while also demonstrating the need for fusion in stars to provide the heavy elements in our cosmos. 3. The farther away we look in space, 
the less grown-up and evolved galaxies and stellar populations appear to be, while the largest scale structures like galaxy groups and clusters are less rich and abundant the farther back we look. The Big Bang is verified by our observations. It accurately and precisely describes the emergence of our universe from a hot, dense, almost perfectly uniform early stage. But what about the beginning of time? What about the original idea of a singularity and an arbitrarily hot, dense state from which space and time themselves could have first emerged? That's a different conversation today than it was back in the 1970s and earlier. Back then, we knew that we could extrapolate the hot Big Bang. There was a new theory put forth and developed in the 1980s known as cosmological inflation, which made a number of predictions that contrasted with those arising from the idea of a singularity at the beginning of the hot Big Bang. Specifically, inflation predicted the following points. Going back in time to the first fraction of a second of the observable universe's history, between what we could learn from particle colliders and what we could observe in the deepest depths of space, we had plenty of evidence that this picture accurately described our universe. Choosing a curvature for the universe that was identical to flat to the extent of 99.999% and 99.9999%, roughly equivalent to a singularly hot universe, produced no predictions at all. A universe with a solitary beginning made no such forecast. Instead, a universe devoid of exotic high-energy relics like magnetic monopoles would possess them, point-equivalent temperatures and attributes for the cosmos even in causally distant locations. Reference to a cosmos whose variations in small size were nearly but not quite scale invariant. Such observations are at odds with high size variations produced by a non inflationary cosmos. A universe in which all fluctuations are 100% isotropic and 0% are caused by curvature, there is no choice. In a universe without inflation, a universe that originated from a hot Big Bang cannot have fluctuations on scales larger than the cosmic horizon. Additionally, a universe with a finite maximum temperature that is well below the Planck scale, as opposed to one whose maximum temperature reached all the way up to that energy scale. The first three items were inflationary postdictions. The latter four were forecasts that were not yet realized when they were made. Based on all of these factors, the inflationary model has been successful in ways that the Big Bang without inflation was not. The universe must have been devoid of matter and radiation and instead contained some sort of energy, whether inherent to space or as part of a field that didn't dilute as the universe expanded. This means that inflationary expansion, unlike matter and radiation, didn't follow a proper law that leads back to a singularity but rather is exponential in character. One of the fascinating aspects about this is that something that increases exponentially, even if you extrapolate it back to arbitrarily early times, even to a time where t is greater than minus zero, never reaches a singular beginning. Now, there are many reasons to believe that the inflationary state wasn't one that was eternal to the past. There might have been a pre-inflationary state that gave rise to inflation, and that whatever that pre-inflationary state was, perhaps it did have a beginning. There are some theorems that have been proven and loopholes discovered to those theorems, some of which have been closed and some of which remain open, and this remains an active and exciting area of research still today. But one thing is for certain. Whether there was a singular ultimate beginning to all of existence or not, it no longer has anything to do with the hot Big Bang that describes our universe from that moment when inflation ended. The hot Big Bang occurred, the universe became filled with matter and radiation, and more, and it began expanding. The original definition of the Big Bang has now changed, just as our understanding of the universe has changed. If you're still behind, that's okay. The best time to catch up is actually right now because more and more evidence is showing that the Big Bang wasn't really the beginning of it all. Cooling and gravitating eventually led to our present day. There are still a minority of astronomers, astrophysicists, and cosmologists who use the Big Bang to refer to this theorized beginning and emergence of time and space. Massive galaxies that contradict notions of the early universe have been discovered by NASA's James Webb Space Observatory. These galaxies, which are reported in new research based on Webb's first data published, are so far away that they only appear to the powerful observatory as tiny reddish dots. Astronomers discovered that by examining the light these galaxies emitted, they were observing them in the early stages of our universe, only 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. These early galaxies are not surprising in and of themselves. 
They were expected to form soon after the universe emerged from the so-called Dark Ages, the first 400 million years or so of its existence during which only a dense fog of hydrogen atoms permeated space. However, the galaxies found in the web images appeared startlingly large, and the stars in them were too old. The new findings are in conflict with pre-existing theories about how the universe looked and evolved in its early phases, and they don't match early observations made by Webb's less powerful predecessor, the Hubble Space Telescope. Assistant Professor Joel Leha of Penn State University, who is also one of the study's authors, told Space.com in an email that earlier Hubble and other instrument studies of the early universe have found small, blue, baby galaxies at early times. Objects that have just recently formed out of the primordial cosmic soup and are themselves building their early stars and structures. In general, as stars age, they become dazzling blue. Leha said that before astronomers start rewriting cosmology theories to explain how these galaxies came together so quickly after the Big Bang, they will have to make sure the odd reds they are looking at are not something else. Although most of the alternative explanations for the reddish dots they found in Webb's deep fields appear to be 50 times more massive than that, this was astounding. The astronomers plan to soon turn Webb's near-infrared camera, also known as the NearCam, to these galaxies again in order to obtain light spectra from those that are mysterious and enigmatic. These might emit light in exotic ways due to their lack of heavy elements, and perhaps we're not incorporating those in our models. Alternatively, perhaps our understanding of how stars form locally, for example, how many stars form from gas as a function of the mass of the stars, is totally inapplicable in the early universe. These things would also be exciting to discover, and would also overturn our understanding of star formation in the early universe, albeit in a very different way. Dissection of spectra, the measured light's wavelength composition, allowed for the determination of its source's physical and chemical characteristics. The most significant finding is that spectra provide extremely precise distances to these objects. According to Leha, scientists are already being forced to rewrite their theories about the early universe just over six months after the Webb team released the first observations from the Grand Observatory. This is extremely exciting because, as Leha noted in a Penn State University statement, we looked into the very early universe for the first time and had no idea what we were going to find. It turns out we found something so unexpected that it actually creates problems for science.